a true story in a French church in a big city. There was a Sunday worship service taking place. The service had begun. Members of the congregation had begun worshiping. However, there was no pastor yet. As the service progressed, a man dressed shabbily in a heavy overcoat and wild hair, and he would, could have used a bath, came into the service. He had trouble finding a seat, pretty packed toward the back, like most churches. Finally, a member, a prominent businessman in the community, offered to help the man. He asked him to sit with him and his family. He got him a bulletin, found a hymnal for him, and helped him find the proper place in the bulletin. Of course, the congregation was murmuring about the man. Some were heard to say, doesn't he know how to dress for church? And yeah, Betty and I have heard that one before. Others sitting close by were holding their noses. Parents were trying to stop their children from staring and giggling. The businessman had to help the man stand when the hymn began. The man did not sing. The congregation was getting nervous because the pastor was still not present and soon it would be time for the sermon. The member leading worship was sweating. No scripture was even listed in the bulletin. Think of how you would be feeling if I were not present for worship. Maybe it would be an answer to prayer for you, I don't know. Uh, but I'm sure you were that. Oh, anyways, back to my friend's church. When it came time for scripture and sermon, the stranger stood up and said, the Lord wants me to tell you something today. Heads jerked. Several started to say something. The stranger walked up to the front of the church and started unbuttoning his coat. There was a white robe underneath the old tattered coat. Then the man pulled off his long, unkept wing. It was the pastor. And he said, the word from the Lord today is, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without even knowing it. He called for the last hymn and sat down, leaving the coat and wig in the middle of the floor. Now, I don't know if the message ever really reached the congregation, but I'm sure it made them think. And today, like I said, I wish to talk about the first part of my title, Feel Welcome. Being polite and showing kindness are the same family, all summing up the idea of hospitality. Now, the story, as I heard it, was a little different than that, but it is what a pastor actually did one time and it did get the congregation's attention at least. One author wrote, always be polite to a dragon. It's harder than it sounds. Dragon etiquette is incredibly complicated, and if you make a mistake, the dragon eats you. How often have you entered a church and felt like you were the only one not really welcome or wanted there? I told you about Betty and Mai's experience. When I was down at 9-11, I was visiting the churches in the area that survived the, the uh, meltdown. And I walked into a Mooney church. Now, if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's an interesting faith, not one I agree with. And I felt such an uncomfortable spirit when I walked in, I turned around and walked back out, and I hadn't met a soul. Have you ever had this person greet you as you entered the house of worship? The same guy who went in for the job interview sits down with the boss. The boss asks him, what do you think is your worst quality? The man says, I'm probably too honest. The boss says, that's a bad, not a bad thing. I think being honest is a good quality. The man replies, I don't care what you think. <laughs> Do you and I recognize the true importance of the gift of hospitality? Now, not all of us have the gift of hospitality, and I'll talk about the differences in a minute, but all of us can be hospitable. Senior John Charles Thomas, at the age of 66, wrote to the syndicate 
syndicated columnist Abigail Van Buren, quote, I am presently completing a second year of a three-year survey on the hospitality or lack of it in churches. To date, of the 195 churches I have visited, I was spoken to in only one by someone other than the official greeter, and that person asked me to move my feet. I ask, are we too critical of people? I'm inclined to think our world is definitely headed that way. Like most of the gifts, we've all been called to display some degree of hospital hospitality. Hospitality is a special ability, as you've already heard, that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to provide an open door, a warm and welcome, and a warm welcome for those in need of food, lodging, and other basic necessities. Other ideas about hospitality. To be an agreeable guest, one needs only enjoy oneself. Interesting, think about it. If you want to become the perfect guest, then try to make your host feel at home. Good manners sometimes mean simply putting up with other people's bad manners. Hospitality is the art of making people want to stay without interfering with their departure. So practice hospitality. Zondervan Illustrated Bible talked about my text for today and we'll get there in a minute. Hospitality was especially important in first century world where motels and hotels were virtually unknown. Christians traveling on ordinary business in the service of the church depended on fellow Christians for lodging and food. Paul not only commands believers to exercise hospitality, he encourages them to pursue it. And my text for today, okay. Share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Now you know the interesting thing I found in Saudi Arabia was even though Islam was the preferred religion, they respected me as a chaplain. They said they also believed in Jesus, we just didn't go far enough. Muhammad was a true prophet. But they showed hospitality no matter where you went. That was part of their culture. You treated people with respect especially the strangers. The definition, the distinctive ability to make people feel at home, welcome, and part of the group. 1 Peter 4.9 tells us, practice hospitality to one another, those of the household of faith, amplified version. Be hospitable, be a lover of strangers, with brotherly affection for unknown guests, the foreigners, the poor, and all who come your way who are of Christ's body. And in each instance, do it ungrudgingly, cordially, graciously, without complaining, but as representing him. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling, it says in another translation. I think sometimes we as Christians need to be reminded of that. We say we truly believe and we want to be hospitable, but we complain. Now nah, you don't do that, right? But then on the other side, don't overlook your gift. Simply because others don't have it. God never intended for all of us to act the same or have the same gift. Now, as a teenager, I went to a church in DePauleville, New York, which, if you don't know where it is, you go down one hill and then up the other, it's in between. <laughs> but it was a small country church, and we used to walk to church, my brothers and sisters and I. And we had a little old Italian lady in the church, and her ministry was to the teenagers. And she would invite one or two teenagers to her home, her home for dinner after church. And so we would oblige her. 
and we went to her home to eat. I don't know how many of you have ever eaten an Italian meal, fully prepared. You have the appetizer. You have the main meal. You have the dessert. But before you get to the dessert, you'll have a sweet little old lady come up to you and say, come on, have a little more, have a little more. You didn't walk away from her place, you waddled away from her place. But she definitely had the gift of hospitality and I never forgot her because of that. There is a difference between hospitality and the gift of hospitality. Being hospitable is showing genuine Christian care and concern for people. But some people God has gifted with the true ability of hospitality. Reading from Luke 10, we have the story of Mary and Martha. As they continued to travel, Jesus entered the village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister Mary who sat before the master, hanging on to every word he said, but Martha was pulled away. By all, she, by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later she stepped in and interrupted them. Master, don't you care that my sister's abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and won't be taken it won't be taken from her. A pastor told the story of a couple in his church, Jan and Darrell. He said, I've always been openly, they've always been generously, openly generous people. Can't talk today. They make you feel as if you're honored to have you in, in their home. And nothing is too much trouble for them. Which is just as well because they are the small group leaders. Every other week, people in our small group meet to connect with God and each other in an authentic way. We talk about life and faith and how to apply the message on Sundays to the everyday situations each of us face during the week. The pastor went on to say, I noticed Jen and Darrell were hospitable people when I first met them 14 years ago. So I was surprised when we came to their small group and they didn't run out to meet us and bow down to the ground. They just greeted us warmly and welcomed us in. They didn't bring water, take off our shoes, wash our feet, or even offer for us a shower in their bathroom. They didn't go down to the local butcher shop and buy the best custom meat for a barbecue. We normally just bring our own supper and share it around. They didn't break bread, bake bread for us and their bread maker. What kind of hospitality is that? Abraham would have been shocked. Abraham was definitely gifted. Look at the story. Abraham was minding his own business and God showed up in Genesis 1 through 8. Again, message paraphrase. God appeared to a hundred-year-old man, Abraham, at the Oaks of Mame, while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent. I used to see that as I was traveling across the deserts in Saudi Arabia, and the shepherds would be out with their sheep and just sitting there in the middle of the day, enjoying the sun. It was the hottest part of the day. He looked up and he saw three men standing there. And it says he ran from his tent to greet them. He was excited to see them. That's part of the gift of hospitality. He bowed before them. He showed them respect. He said, Master, if it please you, he offered to please them. Stop for a while with your servant. 
people with the gift of hospitality understand that God is not concerned about special abilities, just availability. He offered more than lip service. I'll get some water so you can wash your feet. Rest under the tree. He offered them rest. I'll get some food to refresh you on your way since your travels have brought you across my path. They said, certainly, go ahead. Abraham hurried into the tent of Sarah. He said, hurry, give me three cups of our best flour. Knead it and make bread. He offered the best. Then Abraham ran to the cattle pen, picked out a nice plump calf, and gave it to the servant who lost no time getting it ready. Then he cut curds and milk. I love cheese curd. Brought them with a the calf that had been roasted. He set the meal before the men and stood there. Now this guy's a hundred years old for crying out loud. You ever seen a hundred year old man run? I have trouble making the end of the hallway. He set the meal before them and stood there under the tree while he wait, while they ate. He stood there. He offered his best and remained attentive and ready to assist. Now this is hospitality gone wild. And these three men just accept it. They just sit around in the shade of the tree while this old man and his wife go overboard with kindness. Abraham could simply have called his servant to serve these guys, but he does it himself. When we were setting up for a sunrise service at Letterkenny Army Depot, I was there with my assistant and the commanding general had come out and he was sitting there waiting. And I was starting to move tables. He said, let me help you. Got he comes and gets up, comes over, helps me move stuff around and get things set up. Two-star general, you know. Okay. Abraham could have simply called his servants to serve these guys, but he does it himself. Even though he was rich, influential, and a powerful old man, and old men were respected in his time, yet it is Abraham who shows them great respect and humility. It's getting difficult to pick out the angels in this story. Did you notice how Abraham was quick to be generous? He is able to serve. Sacrifice and servant would characterize the powerful man who was called a friend of God. But there are cautions as with any gift and I hadn't talked about the cautions with the others, and I'll go back and review that at another time. The gift of hospitality, the caution is feeling self-pity, as if you're the only one serving in this way. Martha, she had the gift of hospitality, but she was feeling really left out. Her sister wasn't helping her, and should have been. Overcommitting yourself and potentially neglecting those closest to you. Jesus was the closest one there that she needed to be with, but she did not see that. View your ministry as basically entertaining. Mary is saying, I'm just the host. Not recognizing her responsibility at this time with Jesus there was more than that. That doesn't negate her gift. She just didn't fully understand how to use it. Viewing your ministry is basically entertaining. It is not. One author, author put it this way. A bar is the closest thing to a church the world has. Do you ever think about that? The TV show Cheers was set in the friendliest bar you've ever seen. Sam was like the pastor. The bartenders were like the deacons. The waitresses were like the greeters and ushers. It's almost like a counterfeit church where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. You want to go where people know people are all the same. You want to go where everyone knows your th name. That's the theme song for Cheers in case you haven't watched it. Doesn't that make you almost want to go to a bar? But not now, please. A place where a person can rest, 
People come to church for that purpose, not to be agitated, not to be irritated. Not true. I say things that irritate people at times. You may say things that irritate people at times. That's between you and God. As long as everything you're doing shows love and respect for one another. Rest from the long journey. Rest from the battlefield of the world. Rest and find a friendly place. Hospitality, evidence that you have the gift. New people tend to enjoy your company and tend to migrate toward you. You, you give without expecting anything in return. You experience joy by helping others feel at home and cared for. You love a party, but enjoy giving one even more. Now that part leaves me out. I've never been a party person. Although we had to attend a few in our days. And you eagerly open your home to others. When it comes to showing hospitality, maybe we want to think of the church as a hospital for sinners. Do we make them feel welcome? Some are content with placebos, fake medicine, that you think are healing, so you feel good. Things that get you excited, like the music or a joke in the sermon or an emotional speaker. Things they receive as entertainment and you think it's the Holy Spirit. Then you have some who seek simply plastic surgery. They make an appearance, walk around with a big and unused Bible in their arms. They look good, but they're the same inside. Some are satisfied with painkillers. Messages of hope are important, but like painkillers, are addictive and don't address the actual issues. Whereas some seek to sit at the banquet table and they receive greater and lasting delights. They come for healing for the cause of their illness, sin. They get inoculations from viruses like heresy, by learning sound doctrine. They come for a transplant, a new heart. Are we hospitable? One last story, and it reminds me of one of my own, but I wanted to use this one. A man tells of his experience. He says, quote, I'm a Corvair man. Now, how many besides me know what a Corvair is? Okay, we've got a few in here, then that, you'll understand this. That means I drive old, 60 years or more. Cars with air-cooled engines and no shoulder harness. I've been driving these cars since I was 16. I've grown accustomed to them, even preferring them over all other cars. I don't collect old cars, I drive them. For some people that would seem rather risky proposition. When they look at an old car, they see 60-year-old ball joints, pistons, bearings, and heater fans. And when I read that, I thought about, when I look at myself, what do I see? Old, worn out bones and joints. These things that just have to be break sometime. And that many years, it's likely to happen when you least expect it at the most inconvenient time. The worst fear would be that they would happen while driving down some lonely back road and bang, now what do you do? I must admit, the thought sometimes passed my mind as well. I know that my car is old. It was manufactured in 1965, and the steel, rubber, plastic, and leather in the car, although remarkably preserved, <clears throat> is well past its prime. However, there is really one aspect of driving the car that continuously bothers me. Since Corvair engines are air-cooled, there's a very critical fan belt that travels from the cooling fan over the pulley down to the crankshaft. When the belt breaks, the engine will quickly overheat and making the driving the car impossible. I've learned over the years to always carry a spare fan belt and proper tools for removing the old one and installing, installing the new one. I learned this, however, only after suffering such a breakdown on a very lonely back road with nothing but a distant farmhouse in sight. There I sat, it was getting dark, 
This was a day long before cell phones and other emergency conveniences. I knew that I couldn't drive the car for fear that I would overheat the engine and fry the valves. That would mean a very sensitive and time-consuming engine overhaul. There seemed to be only one course. I would have to walk a mile or so to that farmhouse and ask to call for a tow. I trudged over the field and fence and finally arrived at the house. The porch light was on and I could hear a faint sound of a television set somewhere back in the recesses of the dimly lit house. I knocked and a stocky man in bib overalls opened the door. Seeing the worried look on my face, he surmised quickly that I had some road trouble, as he called it. I acknowledged his suspicion and told him I had broken a fan belt and would need a tow. I asked to use the phone, his phone to call AAA. He hesitated for a moment and then did something I didn't quite expect. He asked me if I would mind if he could tow me up to the barn. He said that he had a wall of belts and one of them was bound to fit. I thanked him, but sadly saying I really wasn't dressed properly to mess with such a grimy job. Don't worry, he said. I think I can give you a hand. He pulled out the old farm hall and we sputtered down the lane toward the stranded car. It wasn't long and we had it pushed into the barn where in fact he did have nearly every belt imaginable hanging on the wall. Motioning to me to stand back and give him room, he quickly extracted the shredded belt and matched it up with one of equal length from his wall. A wrench, a screwdriver, and a crowbar later, the new belt was installed and I was ready to go. I thanked him for his assistance and offered to pay him for the belt. Now he said, but you could come up to the house and have a cup of coffee with me and my wife. Ultimately, an hour or so later, I was on the road again, a lesson in mechanics and preparing this richer, a coffee stronger, and a heart filled with hospitality. The author went on to say, it is often said that true hospitality is to be able to make your guests feel at home when you wish he were. I am sure that my hosts that evening, their routine rudely interrupted by a stranger at the door, were put out, so to speak. They had become accustomed to watching the same show on TV, retiring at the same time every night. I am sure there were evening chores interrupted. Yes, they took the time to give them themselves to someone who was all alone and helpless. I was a stranger. They were faithful to a brother, just like the Bible asked us to be. For them, hospitality was something that one dutifully performed because as Christians, they could do nothing less. <coughs> Unfortunately, I will say, it is a brand of hospitality that is becoming rarer and rarer in this increasingly unfriendly and mistrusting world we live in. We live in a society that is individualistic and self-centered. It chafes against the idea that we must be kind to strangers. That's why it's more important than ever for Christians to take the lead and show hospitality whenever we can. A world such as this leaves a lot of lonely, searching people in its wake. It's up to us to find them, fix them, and give them a simple cup of Christian kindness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we prepare ourselves to complete this day of worship, speak to our hearts and challenge us to look for opportunities to show Christian love and Christian hospitality to the people we meet, not only at church, but in our world. We ask this, giving you the glory, Lord. Amen.